Adolf Hitler neither finished school nor had any vocational training. He occasionally lived in homeless shelters or on the street. He refused to pursue a regular job. To this day, it seems inexplicable that he could come to power. Out of nowhere, Hitler became the Führer, leader of the German Reich, one of the most powerful men of the 20th century who brought the world to the brink of disaster and death to millions of people. The nation worshipped him and followed him blindly into the abyss. But during his lifetime, he kept his origins and his life secret. No one should know how or who he was. Hitler's contemporaries, from his birth to his death, flesh out the picture. Who was Hitler? His mother went to mass with little Paula every Sunday. I can't recall that Adolf accompanied his mother to church once. August Kubitzek, childhood friend of Adolf Hitler in Linz. Hitler had no emotional connection to the church. He thought the Christian religion was an outdated, hypocritical, people-ensnaring institution. Christa Schröder, Hitler's private secretary. If the people think I'm a religious man, well, that cannot hurt. Adolf Hitler to photographer Heinrich Hoffmann. I can say with certainty that even before my departure, I learned about Hitler's intention to liquidate patients with incurable diseases, not only incurable mental patients in the event of war. His reasoning was that these would be unnecessary mouths to feed. Fritz Wiedemann, personal adjutant of the NSDAP to Adolf Hitler until January the 19th, 1939. Memoirs in diary form, August the 8th, 1939. Today we witnessed something cruel. Puhler and Bormann showed Hitler the euthanasia film Unworthy Life. It deals with the life and behavior of incurable mental patients in a number of sanatoriums. There was a long discussion afterwards. The Führer had a really harsh attitude. If he had such a child, he would request that it be put out of its misery, not least for the sake of fellow humans. Gerhard Engel, army adjutant to Hitler. For many of Adolf Hitler's crimes, no documents exist that verify his direct and immediate responsibility. It is different with the centrally organized killing of the mentally handicapped, referred to as euthanasia. Sometime in early October 1939, Adolf Hitler signs a backdated order for September the 1st, the day of the start of the war. With his signature, he authorizes Philipp Buhler, the chief of the Führer's chancellery, and Hitler's young personal physician, Karl Brandt. Reich leader Buhler and Dr. Brandt are entrusted with the responsibility of extending the authority of physicians so that patients who, on the basis of human judgment, are considered incurable can be accorded mercy killing after a definitive diagnosis. Adolf Hitler. One day, we were surprised by a report that a euthanasia operation was underway in Swabia. Family members received the ashes with the official notice that the beloved deceased had unfortunately died quite suddenly of pneumonia or from an infectious disease. Through faulty communication of such condolences and sometimes double deliveries of urns, unrest was created among the population and the clergy. Reinhard Spitzi. Austrian member of the SS, 
and NSDAP. The Bishop of Münster, Clemens August Graf von Galen, finds the courage to deliver a frank opinion in public. Sermon in St. Lambert's Church, Münster, August 3, 1941. So now we must expect that poor, defenseless, sick people will be killed sooner or later. Do you, or do I, only have the right to live as long as we are recognized as productive by others? If it is legitimate to kill unproductive members of the community, then woe betide our brave soldiers who return home from war with serious battle wounds as invalids. If the principle that man is entitled to kill his unproductive fellow man is established and applied, then woe betide all of us when we become aged and thus unproductive. Clemens August Graf von Galen, Bishop of Münster. Von Galen's brave protest is based on concrete critical points and is successful. The conflict between the Hitler regime, the Bishop of Münster and other public critics is settled only partially. Hitler suspends the largest part of the euthanasia program for more than a year, after more than 70,000 people had been killed. In less conspicuous forms, the euthanasia program was reintroduced to sanatoriums and nursing homes and practiced right up to the end of the war. The Führer called me into the Reich Chancellery at 4 p.m. today. To start with, he spent a whole hour describing the campaign in Poland. The Poles, only a thin Germanic layer. Underneath that, dreadful stock. The Jews, the worst that you could possibly imagine. Only a master's heavy hand could rule here. Alfred Rosenberg, director of the Foreign Policy Office of the NSDAP. Two days later, I went to the Warsaw Ghetto. A brick wall about eight feet high had been built around the entire desolate area, from which all the Aryans had been evacuated and into which more than 400,000 Jews had been forced. The entire population of the ghetto seemed to be living in the street. There was hardly a square yard of empty space. As we picked our way across the mud and rubble, the shadows of what have once been men or women flitted by us in pursuit of someone or something, their eyes blazing with some insane hunger or greed. Frequently, we pass by corpses lying naked in the streets. Jankowski, Courier of the Polish Underground. For a long time, researchers and prosecutors searched for a definitive written order from Hitler for the murder of European Jews. Such an order from Hitler on the final solution of the Jewish question obviously doesn't exist. Service calendar Heinrich Himmler, Himmler's lecture notes. Führer headquarters, Führer, Wolfschanzer, July the 18th, 1941, 4 p.m. Jewish question? Exterminators, partisans. Restructuring of the Waffen SS. In any case, I'm totally convinced, even without written proof, that the extermination of the Jews goes back to a specific order from Hitler. Because it's unthinkable that Himmler and Goering would have carried this out without his knowledge. Nikolaus von Belo, Luftwaffe adjutant to Adolf Hitler. Immediately after the invasion of the Soviet Union by the Wehrmacht, the 3,000-man death squads of security police and the Reich Security Service begin their killing operations. The political responsibility lies with Hermann Göring, to whom Hitler has transferred the coordination of Jewish policy. If I am asked whether I knew about the shooting of the Jews, I have to say that I received an order to attend the shooting of Jews as a spectator. 
I remember that we had to be at the shooting site at 8 p.m. A Navy Captain Lipaya. Around noon, an old man from Lower Saxony, Colonel Scheer, visited me. Among the things he talked about that were especially horrible was the shooting of Jews. He'd been told by another colonel, Tippelskirch, I believe. Ernst Junge, Captain, Paris, Diary. I saw a long, deep ditch. SS men and Latvian police, in plain clothes, wearing armbands, were standing beside it. The terrain was overgrown with bushes, and the ground was sandy. We watched about one and a half hours of the execution. During this time, three to four trucks were brought in from the city to the shooting site. Then the victims were driven like cattle from the truck to the ditch. Each time, five had to march in single file into the ditch. The shooting took place under the command of the SS. The victims stood facing us. I can remember exactly that after the salvos, the victims collapsed. A Navy Captain Lipaya. Letter to the SS and Latvian Police Chief, Commander of the Riga Police Force, January the 3rd, 1942. The execution of the Jews carried out in the time frame of the report is still the talk of the local population. The fate of the Jews is deplored numerous times, and at the moment, you hear few people in favor of their elimination. Among other things, there is a rumor circulating that the execution was filmed. SS and Police Chief Lipaya. Memoirs in diary form. A grim, gloomy mood. Führer had a long discussion with Himmler, and afterwards there was the usual corresponding atmosphere. Gerhard Engel. Hitler never told me anything about the treatment of the Jews. In foreign policy, the subject only arose when the Jews were to be deported from some country or other. Franz von Sonnleitner, an SDAP member, after 1939 legation counselor in the foreign ministry. Adolf Hitler addressed to the traditional gathering in the Munich Bürgerbräu Keller, November the 8th, 1942. You will recall the Reichstag session at which I declared, if Judaism imagines for a moment that it can bring about an international world war for the extermination of the European races, the result will not be the extermination of the European races, but the extermination of the Jews in Europe. I was always derided as a prophet. Countless numbers of those who laughed at the time are no longer laughing today. Those who are still laughing now will perhaps not be laughing much longer. Danziger Vorposten, Daily Newspaper, May the 13th, 1944. Jewry records major losses in other regions of Europe. The core areas of Jewish settlement that we found in Poland, like those in Warsaw and Lublin, have today been neutralized. The settlements of one and a half million Jews in Hungary are currently being dealt with in a similar fashion. Thus, in these countries alone, five million Jews have been eliminated. In other European countries, long-standing state measures against Jewry are also increasing. Wilhelm Löbzak, provincial NSDAP propaganda director in Gdansk, West Prussia.
During a military briefing around autumn 1944, the Reich press chief Dietrich came up with an English report. In this newspaper article, it was alleged that the Russians had taken a German concentration camp by the name of Majdanek. Pictures showed racks, on which a large number of combs could be seen, well laid out as foreigners expect to see in a German institution. The text said that people had been exterminated here. Dietrich presented the press report to Hitler. We stood there with bated breath to hear what he would say. The answer was swift. Those are the hands of Belgian children chopped off during the First World War. It's nothing but enemy propaganda. I believe that I have quoted Hitler's statement correctly. In any case, we were all relieved. Franz von Sonnleitner, after 1939 legation counselor in the foreign ministry. On the third day of the war, I was wounded near Grodno. When I came to, there were many wounded lying on the ground. We were at the mercy of the German soldiers. After a while, those who could move were driven onwards. My comrades grabbed me under the arms because those who fell down were immediately shot. Dmitri Dmitrienko. Since February 1938, Adolf Hitler has been the supreme commander of the military. In this capacity, he's responsible for the mass killings of Soviet prisoners of war. Whereas 1 to 3% of Anglo-American prisoners die, some 50% of Red Army prisoners perish. Of the roughly 5.3 to 5.7 million Red Army soldiers in German captivity, 2.5 to 3.3 million die. Estimates vary. Only the gravediggers were given food. The camp was set up in a dense forest, a pine forest. We scratched the bark off with a nail and fed ourselves that way. After a while, the whole forest had been eaten. Boris Sheremet. Army command is fully aware of the situation and condones the starvation of Soviet prisoners. In November 1941, when the chiefs of staff of the East Armies tell the quartermaster general that the armies need Soviet prisoners as laborers, but that these are starving in camps, he states, Prisoners of war who do not work have to starve. Working prisoners of war can, in some cases, be fed army provisions. Eduard Wagner, Quartermaster General. Letter to Wilhelm Keitel. The fate of the Soviet prisoners of war is a tragedy of huge proportions. The large majority of them have starved or died from exposure to the weather. Alfred Rosenberg, Minister for the Occupied Eastern Territories. Wilhelm Keitel, Chief of the Armed Forces High Command. Such doubts belong to soldierly concepts of chivalrous warfare. Here we are dealing with the destruction of an ideology. For this reason, I approve and support these measures. I keep hearing that Hitler could not have known about everything. This is sheer nonsense. I know from personal observation and remarks by Hitler that he knew everything. Heinz Linger, Valet to Adolf Hitler. Up until 1940, Hitler looked younger than he was in reality. After that, however, he aged rather quickly. Up to 1943, he looked his age outwardly. Later, his rapid physical deterioration was obvious. 
Professor Dr. Hans Karl von Hasselbach, Deputy Attendant Doctor to Adolf Hitler. The death of a human being didn't bother him at all. He saw people as the links in a long chain and he considered the first link to be himself. Children were in his eyes only the potential by which the greater or smaller living space of a people was measured. Christa Schröder The soldiers that I met were not followers of Hitler and only served the Führer unwillingly, but all approved of war as an indispensable phenomenon of life. The war is the ultimate exertion that you cannot dodge. This picture was deeply ingrained in them. Wilma Sturm, journalist and writer. Diary. Monday, July the 26th, 1943. Mussolini has resigned. He's said to be ill. Last night, Hamburg, Essen and Kiel were bombed again. Henrietta Schneider. While I endeavoured to establish worthwhile targets to Hitler and the general staff of the Air Force, our enemies launched five big attacks on only one major city, Hamburg. Although this action contradicted all tactical considerations, it had catastrophic consequences. Albert Speer. Diary of fighter pilot Hans Ahrens, born 1921, killed in action February the 21st, 1944. That first night of terror on July the 25th will remain unforgettable for us and the majority of all Hamburg residents. Personally, I'm glad that I experienced it all. As a soldier, it led to an ultimate, resolute hatred of our enemy. Letter to Georg Zimmermann, soldier in Norway, from his mother, Hamburg, July the 28th, 1943. Dear Georg, we are still alive, but Hamburg de facto no longer exists. No house left standing, just mountains of rubble, entire streets blocked, dead bodies not salvaged, impenetrable smoke and fumes and fires still burning everywhere. Disintegration is in progress. No police anymore, nothing. Hamburg is lost forever. Magdalena Zimmermann. When I travelled to the Badine from Babelsberg, I met an acquaintance on the train. He'd experienced it all in Hamburg as an anti-aircraft soldier. It smelled so strongly of corpses that you couldn't get the stench out of your nose. Leaflets were dropped over Hamburg, with quotes from the war speeches of Hitler and Goering without any comment. Erich Kessner, writer, War Diary. Hamburg, July the 30th, 1943. My Hanele, words can't express what we are going through here. A government that cannot protect its women and children is simply criminal. My Hanele, if I could only hear one word from you and Georg. Your mother, Magdalena Zimmermann. When he traveled to Bavaria to the Berghof, or the Führer headquarters, then he went by train and at night with blacked out windows so that he wasn't faced with the devastation from the bombing raids. Bernd Freitag von Lohenhofen, Captain. During the entire war, Adolf Hitler never once visited a bombed city. Albert Speer. Dr. Theo Morell, Adolf Hitler's personal physician. Diary, September the 23rd, 1943, 8.15 p.m. Examination after dinner. Strong flatulence, spasms from agitation, 
Stomach shows increased fat formation. Prescribed a diet. He admired Morel and his art and was, in a sense, dependent on him and his medication. Albert Speer. New Year's Proclamation, 1944. The year 1944 will make hard and heavy demands on all Germans. The monstrous events of the war will come closer to crisis this year. We are fully confident that we will endure. Adolf Hitler. Diary, May the 27th, 1944. An impression of an increasingly destroyed Berlin, devastating. At the same time, Berliners are sitting in the sunshine on chairs amid the rubble and debris on the esplanade, as if it were peacetime. Ulrich von Hassel, diplomat and member of the resistance. Diary, May the 9th, 1944. Patient A, tension headache left side, legs trembling due to agitation. Invasion imminent, but where? Dr. Theo Morel. The plutocratic world of the West can undertake its threatened landing attempt whenever it wants. It will fail. Adolf Hitler, order of the day to the Wehrmacht. Hitler was told of the landing on the morning of June the 6th. He expressed relief when he received the first report and said now it would be possible to beat the enemy. Niklaus von Below, Luftwaffe adjutant to Adolf Hitler. The conviction of the Germans that we would not attack in the weather then prevailing was a definite factor in the degree of surprise we achieved. In the Omaha sector, an alert enemy division, the 352nd, which prisoners stated had been in the area on maneuvers and defense exercises, accounted for some of the intensive fighting in that locality. Dwight D. Eisenhower, U.S. General, Supreme Allied Commander, Europe. Heinz Linger, valet to Adolf Hitler. Among Hitler's habits, which despite our efforts couldn't be remedied, was that he kept asking what time it was, above all, during the war. I principally only ever stop at five past 12. Adolf Hitler, in November 1942. On July the 20th, 1944, I'd received the order to prepare for the move of the operations unit from Mauerwald to Zossen, south of Berlin. It was a hot East Prussian summer's day. Mauerwald was located just 20 kilometers away from the Wolfschanze, where Stauffenberg's bomb exploded around 12.45 p.m. Bernd Freitag von Lohenhofen. I remember thunder combined with a brightly flashing flame. At the same time, thick smoke. After a few seconds of complete silence, I heard someone call. It was probably Field Marshal Keitel. Where is the Führer? Heinz Buchholz, stenographer in the Wolfschanzer headquarters. There were agitated calls for a doctor. A bomb exploded, nothing happened to the boss, but the hut was blown sky high. Christa Schröder. Heinz Linger. When I arrived, I saw Hitler, who looked at me inquiringly with big eyes and stared at my troubled face. With a calm smile, he said, Linger, someone tried to kill me. Diary. Friday, July the 21st, 1944. The radio broadcast details of the attack. The bomb was planted by a Count von Stauffenberg. Around one o'clock, the Führer spoke to prove that he had survived. What would have happened if the Führer had died? The war would be over and there would be revolution in Germany. 
Henrietta Schneider. His confidence, his faith in victory and his assurance, but also his power consciousness and delusions of grandeur now exceeded all boundaries of reason. Traudl Junge, Hitler's private secretary. Personal War Diary, October the 7th, 1944. Morning briefing. Beginning of the attack on East Prussia and Budapest. Long discussion with Göring. Station 12 heavy anti-aircraft batteries immediately to protect the Führer's headquarters. Keitel for relocating to Berlin. Hitler against it. Werner Kreipe, General of the Aviators, Chief of Staff, Luftwaffe. In the first days of November 1944, we moved out of the Wolfschanze because the Russians were close by. Traudl Junge. Germany was under intense pressure. At the end of 1944, weapons production fell sharply. Trapped in the east, southeast, south and west, Germany was strategically encircled and could not break free. Nevertheless, Hitler took one ultimate measure after the other. The Nazis suppressed without mercy the slightest opposition to their regime. It was clear to us that Germany was mobilizing its last forces. But at the end of 1944, Germany was still able to defend itself and put up serious resistance. Its military still consisted of around 17.5 million men, of whom 5.3 million were fighting troops. Georgi Zhukov, Commander-in-Chief, First White Russian Front. At just 19 years old, Walter was also killed in action. I was sitting on the roof of our house that had been damaged in another bombing when I saw the postman bring the death notice. My aunt called through the house, Walter has fallen. The death of my brother was a deep shock for me. Helmut Kohl, schoolboy. Speech to division commanders, December the 12th, 1944, in Adlerhorst, near Ziegenberg, Hesse. If we suffer a few more really hard strikes, then this artificially maintained common front can suddenly collapse at any moment in a huge clap of thunder. Adolf Hitler. Hitler revealed the following to a very limited circle of listeners. Due to a noticeable weakness of enemy forces in the Eiffel region, he had decided to start the attack from there. The target had to be Antwerp. Siegfried Westphal. Major General, Chief of Staff to the Commander-in-Chief West. On December the 16th, 1944, General Bradley came to my headquarters to discuss ways and means of overcoming our acute shortages in infantry replacements. Just as he entered my office, a staff officer came in to report slight penetrations of our line. It was through this same region that the Germans launched their great attack of 1940. Dwight D. Eisenhower. German tanks have been spotted north of the city of Luxembourg. Rundstedt has ordered the tanks to advance through the Ardennes in nearly the same place as the Germans penetrated in May 1940. They're heading in the same direction again, to the Channel coastline towards Antwerp, in order to stop the Allies using the port through which their main supplies come. Stefan Heim, Corporal of the US Army, writer. It was my opinion that it was necessary to play Hitler's last card to maximum effect. As a gawker, I tried to get as close as possible to the front. The troops pushing forward were in a good mood because low-hanging clouds prevented any aerial activity. 
I was worried that the weather would brighten up. Albert Speer, Memoirs. As long as the weather kept our planes on the ground, it would be an ally of the enemy worth many additional days. Dwight D. Eisenhower. Our last major offensive in the West, with 300,000 men that was so gloriously successful at the start, failed in the end thanks to 10 days of radiant sunshine. The Anglo-Americans were thus able to deploy their overwhelming air superiority. Léon de Grel, commander of the Walloonian Waffen-SS. The Allies had expected to reach the River Rhine by Christmas at the latest. The Ardennes offensive prevented that. But how many men lost their lives due to this senseless delay? Walter Rowland, industrialist, commissioner for tank production in Ministry of Armaments and War Production. Rudolf Jordan, provincial NSDAP leader, defense commissioner, December the 25th, 1944. When we were sitting together one sunny morning, tears appeared in my wife's eyes. Where will we be at Christmas next year? This was the question asked by the mother of our children, the question of the family's fate. This question would be asked in the house of the provincial leader and everywhere else in Germany. I was frightened because I felt that the answer was no longer convincing. But I had to remain the same person, Hitler's deputy, the spokesman of German hope until the end. I know today that it was the belief in a miracle. In the days after Christmas, it was clear that the expected success would not be achieved. At the end of the year, the offensive had to be seen as a failure. Niklas von Bello. Adolf Hitler, at the end of December 1944, to his adjutant, Nicolas von Bello. I know the war is lost. Their superiority is too great. I would prefer to put a bullet in my head now. We will never capitulate, never. We can perish, but we'll take the world with us. December the 31st, 1944, Luxembourg. You sat there with a half-empty glass in your hand and listened to the hoarse voice with the unmistakable accent. Two or three times the speaker almost lost his voice. And he also got his words mixed up, but that was always the case when he got excited. It was significant that his throaty bellow no longer wanted to work that New Year's Eve. Stefan Heim, Corporal of the U.S. Army, writer. Adolf Hitler, last radio address to the German people, January the 30th, 1945. Thus, I now appeal to the entire German people to gird themselves with a yet greater, stronger spirit of resistance until we can again, as before, put on the graves of the dead of this titanic struggle, a wreath inscribed with the words, and yet you were victorious. I therefore expect every German to fulfill his duty to the utmost, to make every sacrifice that will and must be required. February the 13th, 1945. The model of Linz is finally finished. The extensive model of the development of the Danube riverbanks was now set up in one of the large, brightly toned basements of the new chancellery. When I led Adolf Hitler into this room, he stood for a long time just looking, as though overwhelmed by the general impression. 
I moved the spotlight to the position of the sun's rays in the afternoon. Now he was presented with the perspective of how his city on the Danube would look in his retirement. Hermann Giesler, General Building Inspector for the redevelopment of the city of Linz. Not a day went by when the government quarters were not attacked. When a bomb exploded nearby, the bunker lying in the groundwater swayed noticeably. The light began to flicker, so Hitler raised his voice as if in a dream. That was close. Those bombs could have hit us. He was noticeably fearful and didn't feel safe. Christa Schröder. In mid-March 1945, Hitler transfers nearly all of his activities to the bunker under the Chancellery. Since then, he rarely sees daylight. Sometime in mid-March, Eva Braun arrived at the Reich Chancellery. Hitler tried his best to get her to go back to Munich, but she made it clear that her place was at Hitler's side and no one would be able to change her mind. Rohus Misch, telephone operator in the Führer's bunker. April the 20th, 1945 was always referred to as the date of the last photos and film segments of Hitler and the delegation of the Hitler Youth. This is not true. They are in fact from a different reception of a delegation by Hitler. This took place on March the 20th, 1945. Artur Axman, leader of the Hitler Youth. It was between 3 and 4 a.m. on April 11th, 1945. Suddenly cries were heard. They grew louder and louder. We stumbled outside to discover the cause. Look, the gate! Somebody shouted. The crooked swastika had disappeared. Something white fluttered on the flagpole the delightfully victorious minute for which our German comrades had waited for 4,453 days and nights was finally there. In the evening, an American infantry unit arrived. Thomas Geffer, German Jew, prisoner in Buchenwald. April the 12th, 1945. It will not be pleasant listening. I propose to tell you of Buchenwald. We reached the main gate. The prisoners crowded up behind the wire. There surged around me an evil-smelling stink. Men and boys reached out to touch me. They were in rags and the remnants of uniforms. Death had already marked many of them, but they were smiling with their eyes. Edward Morrow, radio correspondent for CBS News. On April the 21st, our troops reached the Berlin Autobahn Ring. This success created favorable conditions to totally enclose the fascist capital. Vasily Chuikov, General. That day, I saw Hitler only briefly. The boss could still not believe that the Russians were at the gates. Rohus Misch. Sechlin Mecklenburg. Around 11.50 p.m., Hitler calls. He gives a short lecture on the situation and concludes with the words, You will see, the Russians will suffer the biggest defeat the bloodiest defeat in their history before the gates of Berlin. Karl Koller, Chief of the General Staff of the Luftwaffe. April the 22nd, 1945. This date marks the end of the Third Reich for me. The German Wehrmacht capitulated on May the 8th, 1945. But on April the 22nd, a Sunday, Hitler capitulated. Rohus Misch.
On April the 22nd, we attended the status report at the usual time in the afternoon. I recognized immediately that clouds as heavy as lead were hanging over the room. Wilhelm Keitel, Chief of the Armed Forces High Command, memoirs. I have already reached my decision. I won't leave Berlin again. I will defend the city till the end. Either I lead the fighting around the capital of the Reich, or I perish with my soldiers in Berlin and die in the battle for the symbol of the Reich. Adolf Hitler. During the status conference, which had been loud and turbulent, Hitler had finally uttered the magical sentence and since then repeated it to everybody who crept around the bunker disbelievingly. The war is lost. Rojas Misch. Gertraud Traudl Junge. In the small anteroom, Hitler stands motionless. In a distant and commanding manner, he calls out. Get changed at once. In one hour, an aircraft will come and take you to the south. Everything is lost, hopelessly lost. Eva Brown walks up to Hitler, takes both of his hands and says, smilingly and consolingly, as if talking to a sad child. But you know that I'm staying here with you. I will not be sent away. Hitler's eyes begin to light up and he does something that no one has ever witnessed, not even his most trusted friends and aides. He kisses Eva Brown on the lips. The German army dissolved before our eyes. Winston Churchill. Gloom and doom began to spread throughout the bunker. Artur Axman. The Führer comes up to me, shakes my hand and asks, Have you rested a little, my child? I'd like to dictate something. Get the shorthand pad. Gertraud Traudl Junge. My private will and testament. As I did not consider that I could take the responsibility of contracting a marriage during the years of fighting, I have now decided, before the closing of my earthly career, to take the girl who, after many years of faithful friendship, entered the practically besieged city of her own free will in order to share her destiny with me as my wife. At her own desire, she goes as my wife with me into death. What I possess belongs, in as much as it has any value, to the party. Should this no longer exist, to the state. Should the state also be destroyed, no further decision of mine is necessary. Signed, Berlin, April the 29th, 1945, 4 a.m. Adolf Hitler. April the 30th, 1945. I had close contact with Mornka, the commander of the Citadel. Mornka was often with the troops on the front line. On April the 29th, he reported to Hitler that to the north, the Russians were a short distance away from Weidendammer Bridge, to the east in Lustgarten, to the south near Potsdamer Platz and the Air Ministry, and to the west in Tiergarten. That was only a few hundred meters from the chancellery. When Hitler asked him, How long can you hold out? He answered, 20 to 24 hours at the most. Artur Axman. On April the 30th, 1945, around noon, Bormann told me that Hitler's decision was now firm. Then Hitler said to me that he would now shoot himself and that Fräulein Braun would also take her life. The bodies were to be buried. He assigned me to make the necessary arrangements. Otto Günther, SS adjutant to Hitler. My political testament. I die with a happy heart in the face of the immeasurable deeds and achievements of our soldiers at the front, our women at home, the achievements of our farmers and workers and the efforts, unique in history, of our youth who bear my name. 
Above all, I oblige the leaders of the nation and those under them to scrupulously observe the race laws and to offer merciless opposition to the poisoner of all peoples, international jury. Issued in Berlin, this 29th day of April, 1945, 4 o'clock a.m., Adolf Hitler. There cannot be the slightest doubt that Adolf Hitler took his life in the Führer bunker of the Reich Chancellery in Berlin on April the 30th, 1945, with his own hand, namely by a shot in the right temple. Cause of death, District Court 2, Berchtesgaden, December the 8th, 1956. Valet Heinz Linger reports the hour of his death as 3.50 p.m. He says he noted this time from a grandfather clock in the anteroom to Hitler's office. Adjutant Otto Günther cites his final hour as 3.30 p.m. He said he'd looked at his watch. It was not disloyalty, but rather his suicide that put an end to Hitler's organization. He and his organization were one and the same, and thus it ended with him. This man who rose out of nothing had offered himself to Germany at a time when it was longing for a new magnet. He formulated a doctrine based on a mixture of fascism and race theory. The totalitarian system allowed him to act without restraint. The mechanization of the military gave him the trump cards of lightning attacks and surprise. All of this led to repression, and that, in turn, led to these crimes. Charles de Gaulle, Memoirs. <laughs>